You're listening to Cloud Security Reinvented, a podcast for security leaders with a focus on the cloud. Learn best practices from fellow security professionals and how they disconnect from it all at the end of the day. Cloud Security Reinvented. Good morning, or depending on when you are in the world, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Welcome to Cloud Security Reinvented. I'm your host, Andy Ellis. Before I introduce our guest for the week, a quick word from our sponsor, Orca Security. Orca provides agentless security and compliance for your public cloud infrastructure, enabling you to detect and prioritize security risks in minutes, not months. I'm here today with Amanda Fennell, CSO and CIO at Relativity. Welcome, Amanda. Thanks for having me, Andy. Excited. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. You know, across someone's career in security, not only hopefully do we as professionals grow, but the world that we're in changes and we need to adapt to that. So I'd love to get your insight today, especially in light of the transition from the on-premise world that most of us started in to the world of cloud that has increasingly become the default model for IT infrastructure. But first, for some context, I want to talk a little bit about your career journey and specifically the dual role you find yourself in now. Okay. So you, you, I think, really started in the consulting and services world, you know, Guidance, Booz Allen Hamilton, SecureWorks, Symantec. So what was that like sort of beginning on the sort of consulting practitioner versus enterprise practitioner side of the house? Well, I think frustrating might be the most applicable <laughs> word um, because, you know, I went to school for a master's in digital forensics and, and technology and so on. So when you when you have an, an education or, you know, kind of concept in your head of what good is yep. and you go through that and then you go into the real world and you're like, oh, we're not oh, we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to not listen <laughs> at all. So I think it was frustrating because I couldn't apply the knowledge I was getting from school. And then the second part is that it took time for you have to like earn your chops. Yep. And so it takes time for anyone to listen to you and to implement. So more often than not, it was like a, uh, what's the movie, uh, Poltergeist, where like you move the gravestones, but you didn't move the bodies. There were a lot of moments in security and consulting realm where you're like, wait, so you bought all these great tools, but you didn't configure it and return them on. And so I think yep. frustrating is probably how I'd sum up a lot of that, that exposure. Yeah, you know, it's sort of interesting because I think I was on, always on the other side of that. And I think there's always this tension between, you know, the people that you hire to come tell you what to do and the people who have to do it. And I think both sides find it very frustrating. So it's yeah. fascinating to hear it from the other side as well. Yeah. Um, but I think you then did get to put your data forensics DFIR work, you know, into practice. You moved into, I think, Zurich Insurance Company and we're doing the cyber forensics there. So what was that then like? Yeah. So um, it was a long time courtship, which happens. Mm -hmm. It was a long time courtship that somebody tried to recruit me for like five years because I supported mm -hmm. them in Symantec as their managed security service delivery manager. And I think it was just one day they had an incident when I was on site doing a quarterly business review as consultants do. Yep. And I was doing the QBR and they had an incident and I like looked over in the middle and I was in the war room. I was a trusted person. So I was in the war room and I like looked over and was like, Oh, I know that malware. My background's like all malware. Yeah. So I can tell you what's still, I, you need to go look for this service. And at that moment, it was like the person who was my like advocate for me, like twisted over and looked over and was like, so we got to hire her. Like, this is enough. We're going to, we got to bring her in. And the whole reason it was a lure to go there was to be able to finally implement the things I'd always wanted to implement for somebody to finally say, okay, you have great ideas. Mm -hmm. Here's some people, here's some budget, here's some power, go see what you can do. And I just really enjoyed that. It was a wonderful time that I grew a lot very quickly. So it was a short time, but it was a really great time. That sounds pretty awesome. Now, mm -hmm. along the way you started teaching, and I think you started at Capital Technology University as an adjunct professor. You're now at Tulane. So what really drew you into that? And what do you teach? So I, I specialize mostly in cybersecurity for grad school, fundamentals, occasionally specific to digital forensics. And this fall, actually, I'm doing web application of uh, pen testing cool. and so on. So we're going to be doing some fun stuff there at Tulane. Originally, I went into the teaching because as a consultant, and this is funny for you and I to have this different perspective, you would often be in a room with the C-levels and not know how to like fight politely yes. <laughs> or defend your information in a polite way. You just get frustrated and be like, no, do it because we said so. 
and I realized that I needed some finesse to it. And there's nothing that adds more finesse to a person than being grilled by 30 plus people randomly all at once. So any <laughs> student can ask you anything, anytime, and you better be prepared and you better be confident. Otherwise you, it's, you know, they smell blood in the water. And so yep. I went into it at the time because uh, Capital is like an NSA farm school. They're, you mm -hmm. know, accredited for that. And so there's just a lot of people in the government around there. It just really made me um, more polished, I think, in terms of how I interact with people in a room. And I think the most important part is that it pivots you to listen to me because I know something, because I think something and I'm right into a realm of, well, I'm curious what made you ask the question. And like you start to become actually more a learner than yep. a teacher at times. And so I've learned a lot from the questions that have gotten asked me over the years and the thought process of my students. So I think it was probably one of the most formative things I did in my career. It made me just a lot better person. Yeah, no, I love that. And it's, I learned a lesson from even just managing people when they ask you those questions that feel off the wall is I created this self-reflection moment where you'd say, what is true in their world that this is a good question? Because if I don't think it's a good question, it means I don't understand where they're coming from. Oh my gosh, that's exactly how it felt. Like in these, right. uh, some of the questions I would get asked, you know, if I had been in a war room with the person, I'd have been like, that is a bad question to ask and we don't have right. time for that right now. But in that realm, in a teaching dynamic, you're like, well, we'll fast. Yeah. Let me, let me seek to understand. And mm -hmm. then let me try to understand how I can communicate in a way that's effective that will light the light inside you. And yeah, love it. I love that. So, you know, four and a half years ago, you went to Relativity as the CSO. So for our listeners who don't know what Relativity is, this is your chance for a quick, you know, 30 second pitch. What does Relativity do? What is Relativity? Easiest thing. It's in legal tech and compliance industry. We have to organize a ton of data. It has to be admissible in court. It has to be accessible for a lot of people across the industry. It has to be secure. So we have an on-prem version, which we refer to as server, and then the cloud version in 2017 was released REL1. We also have a government mm -hmm. version and so on. And we have a trace product, which is for compliance. End result, you got to organize a bunch of data. You got to discover what you need to discover out of it, and you have to act on it. And that's what Relativity does. Now, for everyone in the security realm, the easiest way to say is like Splunk for legal tech. Right. <laughs> It's basically what you're hearing. I love that. No, that's yeah. I, it's really simple and easy to understand. Yeah. So that's fascinating. And you know, I think as the CISO, you have some interesting challenges that are very different there than what you sort of, st where you started your career. So what was that pivot really like that now you're sort of protecting the data that before you were the one who wanted all the access to? I would say there were two gaps when I came in and I, I love being on the flip side of this almost five years later, because now I have like no ego or insecurity about it. But mm -hmm. five years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have given you the very like polished answer. The reality is that my specialty was not cloud and it was not product. So right. AppSec and so on. And so coming in, I was like, no, I just like to, you know, reverse engineer and like do investigations. Now there's an irony to come in and then realize, oh, we need to implement a cyber program here five years ago. And we need to also, at the same time that we're doing this world-class cyber threat intel focused program, I need to learn a heck of a lot about cloud because it's an ever-changing drama of that landscape. Yep. I have to learn how everything works, how containerization works and DevOps cycles and all those different buzzwords. But I also need to all, like be uh, strengthening and maturing our AppSec and the, the typical programs and vulnerability yep. management. I will say it was a steep learning curve for about a year. And I had, for two years for sure, um, I had one thing that I think we all know in security you have to have. I had a guy who was really good and he'd been there since he was an intern. He knew every line of code and 3 million lines of code. He was every, and he was also willing to be interacting dialogue with me that was like almost yep. like fighting at times, but gentle fighting, but it was so helpful for me to learn. So I, and this person's become a long-term friend of mine, even though we don't even work together anymore, but I had that legacy and knowledge I could work with. So it was a big learning curve. Those areas are definitely the hot topics, which I'm sure we talk about today and yep. I'm there. Yeah. And so, uh, what was it about a year ago, you picked up the CIO role. And for Ooh. me, this is fascinating. Because I think, you know, 10 years ago, everybody said, oh my God, the CIO can't also be the CSO. And <laughs> yeah. you're now like the, the fourth or fifth person I've talked to in the last couple of years that have added the CIO role from being the CSO versus the other way around. So what's I, that like? 
You know, it's like a spectrum. You know how when you do a pen test, there's like two types of CISOs, right? There's one type of CISO that's like, I if you find anything, that's bad. And then there's the other CISOs that say, if you find nothing, that's bad. Yep. Okay, so I'm a, if you find nothing, that's bad. That means you didn't find something and there's something to be found always, right? You always right. find something if you look. Okay, so same thing with the CIO versus the CISO thing. There's a spectrum of people who are like, oh, that makes total sense. I can see that's really great. And then there's the other end, like, how can you do that? And it's this yep. constant, like, back and forth of sides. So, and it, it is true, there's times when you sit at the table in the exec room that, okay, which hat am I wearing? But the reality is you're not in the exec room for any one hat. You're in there because your first team is the full exec team. I'm not in there to say, oh, well, security this or IT this. I'm in there to understand the big picture. So I think this is where people kind of separate out and understand things differently. An executive is an executive, whether I'm a CFO, right. a CIO, a CISO, it doesn't matter. Executive skill sets are not just the one function. They're how your one function works organically with the rest. So that was the first one. The reality is I inherited that program from a really great colleague of mine. Um, Andrew Watts is just an amazing guy and he had a great program in IT. And so it wasn't really that difficult for me to get involved in that because it was set up very well. And then I would say, like maybe as a, as a tie off on this one, I see a merger of these two roles, as you've mentioned, yep. it's been kind of a trend towards that. Strategizing, managing, overseeing all the operations that are occurring within a company's IT, including its security and protection. Yep. And I think that's where these, these come together. I don't find it to be difficult. The reality is when somebody brings me an escalation, you should be asking both sides of the questions. How is this affecting the infrastructure? How will this be sustainable? And how is this secure? I think we should be asking all those questions regardless of what executive title you have. Yeah, no, I love that. And I do agree. I think that we're gonna see more merger into the future of these two roles. Part of, I actually think that it's the dedicated CIO role is the one that's on its last legs. I think so too, right? actually. And I, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with the title. I don't know. I don't know that I need it. Um, I don't know that it needs to be a part of it. But maybe it's you need to have the title there so everybody knows who actually has what was that job. I think that it is a legacy title at this point for me. And I think it is because people would wonder, well, where did that go? But I do right. think there is an iteration coming of something different. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know what that completely looks like yet, but it's going to be fascinating to watch. Yeah. So now we've got a, a take on how your career has changed. Now let's look outward. So for you, how has security changed as cloud has become more prevalent? When you started, cloud wasn't even a buzzword. And now no, it like- was Barely, barely was. Yeah. Barely a buzzword. But nobody yeah. knew what cloud was, right? We just said it's other people's computers. But now like cloud is just prevalent. Like we assume if you're building something that it's gonna be cloud, unless there's really compelling reason not to. And obviously in your industry, there is some compelling reasons not to go full cloud. But how has security changed as you've seen that evolve? I think it's similar to, I think I've talked about this in the past a couple of years ago. I liken it to the hotel industry, actually. So this is going gonna, gonna to throw you for a loop. I see that, right? You're like, okay. I'm, I'm very, I started my career many, many years ago in the hotel industry. So now I'm very Super excited. You're going to love this then. But think about how we've changed over the years in terms of what people are seeking and needing and what they're getting. And so back in the day, it was very simplistic. I need a hotel. I'm going to go to a hotel. I'm going to stay in a hotel room. Hopefully they have a gym, maybe if it's a good hotel, um, et cetera. These are the things. And maybe breakfast is included. I don't know. Yeah. I'll and, settle um, for a shower with high water pressure. Yeah, sometimes that's it. So like, and this is the spectrum, right? But yep. nowadays you've gotten all the way to the realm of like, we have many wonderful, like five-star hotels and gorgeous opportunities and services that can be included or for the selective person who's kind of an introvert, you could go to an Airbnb, you can go to VRBO and you can mm -hmm. decide it does that meet my needs and services, but it's private, but I won't get the accessibility of the cool services that are shared. So maybe I won't get a gym, but I would get security, right? right. So I look at the cloud very similar that people have different appetites for different things. Sometimes they just want to know that someone's changing the covers on their bed every night and that they're making sure the towels are clean. Okay. So, okay. I need cloud that I need somebody yep. else to be in charge of infrastructure, making sure that the security, AKA the door cards are locked and, and configured correctly. And that's my bare minimum of the water pressure you mentioned. Right. But that's yeah. cloud. Okay, good. 
And these people who know what they're doing and do it for a living and do it for business, you know, all of the different providers, they do it very well. And they're certified very well on this and many certifications, frameworks, alignments, regulations, et cetera. And they do that for you. You don't go to a hotel room and pay the water bill, right? They take care right. of all those things. Or you have the spectrum of people who are like, my data is in a way that I can't let other people access it for shared services. No problem. You're going to not get access to that amazing gym, spa, et cetera, and breakfast, but you will have an Airbnb that's going to have what you need and it's going to be very secure and it's going to have the security things you need. So prioritization is what's led to a different experience for cloud for different people, I feel, in terms of what's important to them. But the mm -hmm. fundamental one, I feel like it's about infrastructure. They need people to be responsible and they realize that the costs of that on their own is, is just astronomical. And when you look at that trajectory, you're like, I can't deal with this anymore. The cost of security and infrastructure is just too much. Can I pay somebody else for it? Can I get a hotel room? So yeah. that's my theory. No, I, so I really love that. And I might even take it a little bit further and say, you know, with Airbnb and VRBO, it's almost like the hosted data center model which is there's yeah. only one person you're trusting, but you really hope they're trustworthy and that they're not spying on you, yeah. right? But if you really want the ultra premium, like go buy an apartment in every city that you want to visit. And that's sort of, you know, building your own data centers everywhere. With so I think you could- yeah, yeah, 100%, um, that's a really good point. No, so that's, that's fascinating to sort of think about how that's changed. So now let's look at your industry, because I think for a lot of people, it's one of these industries that we just assume exists, but never look at. Yeah. So. How is cloud security different from what I might expect looking at it from the outside? You know, it's funny you should say that because a lot of people are like, huh, legal tech. Okay. What's, what's the thing? You, you think about it and hear about it all the time. And you don't realize it. The Mueller report, Panama mm -hmm. Papers, WikiLeaks, like these are all over the place. And also the fact that this is so prevalent in like the Fortune 500, 110, like all of them are very active in this industry. So the data is out there all over the place. And so how has it changed for our industry? Hashtag COVID. Our industry mm -hmm. is based on data and accessibility to that data so you can find something, right? The truth, analysis, United Nations, using all of these different people, they got to find things, you know? If you can't access it during COVID because everything's on hard drives, what do you do? Well, welcome over to Mama Cloud. Come on over. <laughs> And so a lot of industries had difficulty in COVID, but we were the opposite. The legal tech industry was all about data and access to it. So yep. a lot of people were like, ship it to cloud. It's the only way we can keep functioning. So I think cloud security posture became the biggest thing, the most important for the industry. Luckily, we were in front of that one. Privacy, the PII and proprietary data that's typically used or found in e-discovery, tons of regulations about that. When it comes down to it, customers just trust that we will secure that but it is a, a huge responsibility and it's one that we humbly accept. But you just, you have to focus on both privacy and security and accessibility for this data in this industry. And those are like the three things that cloud can offer when done right. Yeah, no, I love that. And you know, inside that, cause I've had this experience with lawyers, especially outside counsel in my career, which mm -hmm. is that they always hated when I asked security questions. They're like, well, you should just trust us. We're the lawyers. And I'm like, no, I don't, don't want to trust you. Like prove it. So I'm wondering if, and maybe this is a little awkward. We can always clip this one out if uh, you don't like the question. Oh, we're not clipping. I like it already. <laughs> Which is like, do you find that your customers are differently paranoid than you'd expect from other industries? Like I know when I sell to a security professional, like there's some deep technical paranoia. They really want to know why they should trust me versus you know, saying, oh, look, we recognize you have a lot of customers. We see high level, you've got a great program. We're gonna trust you and like you go do the right thing, which mm -hmm. is sort of what from outside, I think maybe that's what the lawyers are doing, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe they're not. So what's your experience interacting with your customer base there? Well, I'm gonna be honest, it's different than what it was five years ago. Okay. So the legal industry five years later, and I say for legal compliance and so on, all of these industries that we work with in these companies, the large corporations, they're different. Lawyers have had to become tech savvy, yep. like nobody's business, and security savvy. So five years ago, the questions they would ask are, do you have ISO? Do you have a CISO? Like it was yep. pretty simple questions. Now it's very specific of what were major findings in your last three you know, rotations? Can we see an output of your pen test reports? And can you give us more information about where the HA is for your cloud and which different data centers? And I'm like, ooh, ooh. ooh much better conversations. Like, 
So I would say that one of the things I've always felt was my job here was to bring the awesomeness of cybersecurity into legal tech. Yep. It is a field that deserves it and warrants it. And so we've worked on that all along. We've always worked on educating the entire legal tech industry about all the aspects of, of cybersecurity, which is why I do a podcast, right? Yeah. There's been a lot of lawyers that will listen to this. And there's a reason why. They're getting savvier. We need That's to great get to hear. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's look back at the practices. You know, you started out saying, I, I got this degree and people didn't always want to listen. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all of those practices that you were recommending at the start of your career, which practice most resonates today is something people still need to be doing. There are three things I'll say. Acronyms. Everybody's going to remember this, right? Because everyone yep. knows in security these acronyms. So the first one, and it comes up every class I teach for CIA, right? Yep. For confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That concept has to still continue to resonate and be known by everyone in the room because then they can understand it could be great if you secure it, but if I can't get to it, you've just defeated yep. the purpose of our job. So CIA is one. Prevent, detect, respond is my mm -hmm. nice way of talking about kill chain and MITRE and attack and pre-attack. Yep. That's too much for a lot of people, but prevent, detect, respond is a conversation you can have and walk three people through very easily. So I think yep. th this is another thing that resonates even now, and it'll always resonate no matter how you build around that. Prevent, detect, respond is a fundamental. But the most important one that I think is changing is the people process in tech. Because mm -hmm. of cloud, everyone knows you need people to do the work, process to do it right, and tech in terms of a tech stack to do these things. And you always see them as three pillars. I don't think that's the same anymore in cloud. I think those are merging and becoming like the Borg, like they're one yeah. super thing now. Your people have to be so merged with the process and the tech has to do it automatically that it becomes secure by default. And so I just think these three things that resonate, people use them now, but they've got to be pushed together. Stop making them three pillars and push them together. Yeah. I love all of those. You know, for prevent, detect, respond, the analogy I've always used to sort of educate people on it is if you walk into the lobby of like any bank building in New York City mm -hmm. or any of the corporate high rises, there's mm -hmm. like gates, you know, some form of you know, scan your badge to walk into the building. And there's a security guard who sits there. Right. And so the, the gate that turnstile is prevent, make sure you, you can't get in unless you have a badge, yeah. the guard is detect. Their only job is to make sure that you don't hop the turnstile. Yeah. Right. And then there's some respond that if you do, and they spot you, like they're calling in somebody and they're going to do something about it. And I think that governs through everything we do is just cause you have a security control. How do you know if somebody's defeating it? I only think this is amusing because I had a conversation a couple years ago for a vulnerability that hit the the news and my, at the time, founder was the CEO and he was like, all right, Amanda, talk me through this. And I was like, cool. You ever go to Costco? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, you know how there's like a greeter that checks your card? And I was like basically going through authentication yeah. and, and authorization and explaining it. And he was like, got it. And I was like, okay, great. But I do the same thing. And I think yeah. That makes the point. Security is really accessible for everyone and it's around every day. You just don't realize it. Yep. So now let's look at the flip side. There are practices that we have been doing just because we've always done them. What should we have just gotten rid of? Killed it off, buried it, put a stake through its heart a long time ago. Oh my gosh. So I'm just going to get one of my triggers, uh, geolocation, like in terms of blocking. Just like yes. the people who say, block everything Russia, like, you know, that kind of thing. It's still a thing that I hear. And every time I do, I'm like, okay, that's not how that works. <laughs> like yeah. we, we should talk this through a little bit. So I think basing your security program, on, that's like a one trigger, by the way. So I'm going to go to a regular, my actual answer would be from a holistic perspective, reactive. It's been painful to watch people who are still reacting to like vulnerabilities and zero days and things like that and not being proactive. I'm not sure why it's such a like reticence in the industry other than, okay, we don't have budget, we don't have time. But the reality is if you don't invest in getting in front and preventative and identifying those threats before they become a thing, you're yep. always going to be late to the land speed, like the speed problem. It's just a speed paradox that you're never going to break. So I just wish people would, it, look, I'm onboarding two people to my jobs right now that work for me. And 
they have all this work that everyone's giving them. And I'm saying to them, I know this is a water hose, but you're never going to like get to the other side of this unless you just like get through this and you have to just deal with the overwhelming amount of information coming at you. It's the same thing. Like nobody wants to take their head out of the sand and actually spend the money time and so on because they're like, well, we'll have breaches and incidents. Hold fast. Like you've yeah. got to do this. You just have to buckle down. So I think that's my tactical answer. And then that's my holistic answer. Yeah, no, I really do. I think our industry has almost over pivoted into the firefighter mentality which says our job is to put out fires versus our job is to stop fires from happening. Yes. Agreed. Right? Yes. Before they well, ever happen, the smoke before signal. they ever happen, yeah, right? Yeah. Or make it so that when they do happen, that they're small fires and not big fires. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. That's our best case scenario is if it does yeah. happen, it's small. So yeah, yep. actually yep. I found this out last night in a kitchen, like how to get rid of a fire and how to stop a fire, like really badly in like a restaurant. Yep. And they asked the question to see who knew the answer. And it turned out somebody was saying like baking soda. And they're like, that's not easily accessible in the fire. A fire extinguisher, obviously that's your best answer. But the reality was salt. It was like yeah. salt just right in front of you. So it's sometimes it's the thing that's right in front of you that's actually going to put the fire out. Mm -hmm. So what has for you been the biggest surprise about the cloud era? Like if we go back, we said at the start of our careers, like it was this buzzword, but that was it. What? did you not anticipate that has become true? Well, adoption. I didn't expect, look, we're slow in security to adopt things sometimes. We like the buzzwords for a couple of years before we buy onto it. So yep. just, you know, disruptive and doing away with proxies or whatever. We, we just take some time and the legal tech industry is the same, by the way. We like to take our time. Adoption for cloud has been slow until people realize you're already on it, actually. Do you right. use Microsoft 365? Like, why are we having the discussion that you're anti-cloud? You're totally already on the cloud. So I think adoption has been weird to watch that and take time for people to understand it. The triggering of people who get upset about it's just someone else's computer. Whoa, people yeah. get mad about that. They're yeah. like, that's not true. And I'm like, I kind of feel like it is, but okay. 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 It's, it's true. Um, so I think like the comes down to it. If I had to summarize the effective communication of what cloud is and what cloud is not, yep. I think that is missing still to this day. And that the more, you know, and the more educated you get about it, the better it gets. So between that and people missing that it's there to be extensible and adaptable and address new problems because you can't get in front of them all the time. Mm -hmm. But the telemetry that cloud gives you access to can get in front of things like that. The ones we're talking about being preventative. If there's a zero day that's seen by Microsoft over here in the Ukraine, it gets implemented in their detections and monitoring around all of their hubs, you know, all their data centers. So that kind of entity and telemetry is just, it's a big miss that people aren't taking advantage of it. Yeah, no, that's a great opportunity for us. So I if you look back at your career, you know, I, there's probably moments you regret. You're like, oh, I wish I had done something different at the time. What's <laughs> the piece of advice that you wish someone had given to you earlier in your career? So early on in my career, I was, I was an archaeologist. And I think uh, between that and then moving into digital forensics, the one thing I would say is like, it ain't all Indiana Jones. It is not what you think. It's not the matrix. It's not Indiana Jones. At the end of the day, an archeologist is just a person sitting in the dirt with a brush, right? And yep. at the end of the day, a computer forensic person or a cybersecurity person and so on is just a person in front of a computer. And that's what we're doing. So I think there's a certain thing of like really acknowledging what is it you're really passionate about? Because mm -hmm. it's not gonna have Rage Against the Machine playing as your soundtrack. Like your life is going to be a little bit different than what you think it is. It's going to be more mundane unless you spice it up. So I think I'd early on wish somebody would told me like it ain't all Indiana Jones and maybe speak up more. In the beginning, I was very quiet. I waited mm -hmm. until I really, really learned a lot. I think I could have spoken up more in the beginning of my career. Okay. Yeah. It's, I have a hard time visualizing you as somebody who didn't speak up. So clearly you did learn that advice. I did. And it's going to amaze you even more. I'm actually like 90% introverted. I know. Yeah. I know. It was a good yeah. one. Learn, learned skills. Now, I actually got to be an archaeologist for a day. So oh, I can, yeah. I definitely, I'm, there's this wonderful archaeological dig in Israel, Beit Guvrin, if you're familiar with it. Yeah, I um, am familiar with it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So for our listeners, you know, Beit Guvrin is basically a giant garbage dump. It's at Tel Marashah, where the Edomites lived. And during the Hasmonean rule, they 
basically evacuated because they didn't want to be forcibly converted. So yeah. they dumped all of their their things they couldn't take with them into the caverns underneath their hill that they lived on the tell. Yeah. And then filled it, it burned it off, you know, filled it with dirt. And so they're digging it out piece by piece. But unlike any other archaeological dig anywhere else in the world, location doesn't matter because they know that these rooms just had stuff thrown into them. So yeah. it's not like, you know, digging dig around. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter. Right. You don't have to map it out. You don't yeah. have to map it out. So they let you go in for a day and you basically sift through the dirt to find like pottery shards. While we were there, we found a fragment of glass that got them all super excited because Aww. the glass had to have been imported. Yeah. And so now they're off to go do chemical mapping to figure out where it came from. But like, that was really cool. But yes, it was just sitting and digging in the dirt. I couldn't imagine doing it every single day. Even in, and this is a great forensic thing for computers, but in the trash, you find out so much in a profile, yes. basically in computers as well. Like you look at that trash, you can see a lot. But in this specific scenario, like um, an archaeology digs that are in that area, they always look at the bones in the trash. Yes. Because if the bones indicate anything like that's pork or so on, then they know that that was not a site where Jewish people were and so on. But yep. great topic. Love it. We do a whole podcast yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of pigeon bones because they raised a lot of pigeons there. Yeah, that's a great one. So looking forward to the future, what opportunities that technology is going to unleash are you most excited about for the next 10, 20, 50 years? You know, um, the buzz of automation has been misaligned and a lot of people feel like they're going to lose jobs because things get automated. And in fact, what I think is that there's going to be automation that takes care of that level one, level two work so that our people who are left are very much going to be able to have a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, and I actually think this industry is going to become way more technical. It used to be that you might not even have any background in this and you could sit down in front of doing log analysis and learn how to do it. I think now it's going to become very technical because all that stuff's going to be done automatically. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're going to have to look at, at the tech skills differently. And I think that they're going to get really refined and become pretty much off the hook. So I'm excited for that. But I think that at the same time, the paradox is that not everybody in your company does security. So I think that the equipping people with that secure by default, but also teaching them how to be the last line of defense as opposed to the dynamic of like, you're the weakest link and stuff. Right. I think we're changing that narrative. I'm working on it day by day. I'm working on changing yeah. that narrative. So I do feel like there's um, a lot of opportunity for us to look back at that people process tech and to put the right tech in place that eliminates the need for a lot of process and allows for people to shine. So I think that's probably the biggest part. It's what I talk about a lot in Security Sandbox and my podcast yeah. season two is theme is just all about tech and people coming together to create something that's unstoppable. And I think that that's where we're looking at. That's really cool. And one of my favorite sayings actually comes from Nancy Levison, who's a professor of system safety. Mm. And she says, human error is a symptom of a system in need of redesign. <gasps> that's super awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Like, I love it when I'm in an instant review and somebody says, what's the root cause? And they say human error. And I'm like, nope. I said the same thing. I'm like, that's never human error is <laughs> the cause human. because you're never going to solve that. That's not the right. answer. So yeah, I love that. Right. Because right. it comes out of the aviation industry where like all plane failures are ultimately pilot error. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But Eventually. then you move past it to say, well, how is it possible for pilot error to crash a plane? Because it shouldn't be possible. Correct. Yeah. I love that. That's a really great point. So what do you do to unwind? Like I have these visions because you're in New Orleans, if I recall. And I so am. to me, I'm like, oh my God, like party city. But what do you actually do to unwind? Just for the record, I moved here March of 2020. So let me oh. dispel that notion from your head, <laughs> okay. first of all. So I actually just finished uh, a culinary degree. So I actually still work in a restaurant, like I mentioned. Um, so I work in a restaurant and I cook. So that's a big part of it. It's What's become your specialty? Like it's French training, um, okay. but if there's a specific dish or et cetera, it's anything confit. Like I'm awesome at confit stuff. I love it. And pasta. I'm a pretty good pasta person. But uh, so I think cooking's like a huge one. I do have like specific things that like are my actual passions, like archery, horseback riding, you know, all these different things. But if you're literally saying, what do you do when you like sit down and unwind? <sighs> I'm so cliche. I read. 
I read a lot. I love books. I watch Criminal Minds like no one's business. That's probably like the bit. It's like documentaries, serial killers. This is my unwinding. That's yep. the big way. But yeah, I think that just naturally and puzzles. It doesn't really surprise probably that it's all about puzzles and, and figuring things mm -hmm. out and profiling. We're security people. Oh, absolutely. And I love that. Yeah, I think a lot of people have the reading. Do you, are you like me? Like I have two different genres for unwinding. Like I have what I consider like my beach reading, which is like right now, you know, game lit and lit RPG. And then I have my like hardcore, like interesting, like epics that I'm going to Oh, wow. Read. I rotate. So I'm going to say something that's going to drive you insane. I actually rotate around 30 books at a time. Yep. Because I don't know what mood I'm in. And so there's yes. no specific genres as opposed to like, I just have like a stack of books and like, it's like all here, but there's like a stack of books that I'm like, well, what do I feel like continuing in today? So I have bookmarks in all of them. It is sacrilege to bend a page. So like yep. I have bookmarks in all of them, but yeah, I rotate through many different genres. I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm actually with you. I'm probably one of the few people who is not offended by that. I'm just surprised that you have them all in one place. I do, but I'm also like really organized. You should oh. see my spice drawer. Like I'm super organized. <laughs> yeah. Now mine are scattered all over the house and just different books and my Kindle and it's crazy. Oh, wow. So let's just quick free form. Give us some wisdom to share with our listeners. Doesn't have to be about technology, but what's something you've learned in your life you'd like to pass on? Now, the way I phrase that, that sounds like a memoriam thing. It's not meant to be. It does. Yes. If when I'm old and gray and on my deathbed and I look back, what do I want people to remember right. about but me? But let's just um, pass it on early. Yeah. I'm sending it now. I'll send it out to the, the thing. You know, I do read a lot and I do come across like a lot of different quotes and stuff that really hit home. And I think there's something to like marinate on. Right. Mm -hmm. So one I've said before, which is not what I'm going to say is for today, but I typically will say my mantra in my head is from Horatio Hornblower and it's always never run on deck. It makes everyone yep. else nervous. And I love that particular one, especially in our, our industry, because you know things hit the fan and everybody looks at you and like right. how you're reacting, just like being a mom. When something really scary happens, all the kids look at the mom to see or the dad right. to be like, am I supposed to be scared? But I would say one thing I've come across that's super helpful for wisdom is never, never tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do and they can surprise you with their ingenuity. And this is Patton, yep. George Patton. But that comes up a lot in conversations with my people I work with when I say that's the top of the mountain. How you get there, I don't care, but I'll see mm -hmm. you up there. And that has been amazing to watch how people react to that. Yeah, no, I love that one. In fact, Patton's got a another quote aimed at the other end of that, aimed at like junior officers that yeah. was like, be ready for that opportunity. And it's like a three sentence quote. So I don't remember the whole thing, but yeah. it's like, be ready for that opportunity to surprise the people who ask you to do stuff because you've prepared for whatever the situation is. Yes. I think it's a great one too. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's got a lot of them. I say, I will say there's a lot of like military in my background while I never served, but I do have a certain alliance with listening to a lot of things. Cause I think a really well-run security program looks an awful lot like a great military operation. So does a kitchen in a restaurant, Yes, but everything has a place and everything has a process. Follow it. My biggest advice, you know, was just like, be the one who hustles. It was always yep. the thing that made sure that I got to the next point in my career is be the one who yep. hustled. Well, I love that. Amanda, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you. This has been such a fun time to spend my time with my coffee. Thank you so much, Andy. <laughs> thank you. Well, you've all been listening to the Cloud Security Reinvented podcast. I'm your host, Andy Ellis, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you for checking out this episode of Cloud Security Reinvented, brought to you by Orca Security. Orca Security detects and prioritizes cloud security risks for AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud without the gaps in coverage, alert fatigue, and operational costs of agents. Please follow Cloud Security Reinvented wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit orca.security slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.